Look, I know the supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. AM 1420 WBSM presents Spooky South Ghost with your hosts Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Good evening, welcome to Spooky South Coast. We're going to do the show handheld style, because <laughs> right as I went to adjust the microphone as we were coming on, it came out. Hold on one second, folks. This is... There we go. Sage the trainer. Welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa, science advisor Matt Moniz, broadcasting on WBSM and also on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. And if you haven't checked in and watched the live video at SpookySouthCoast.com, what are you waiting for? You'll get to see uh, at least myself and Matt Moniz on the screen. We hide Costa over in the corner because uh, he's actually over there looking at uh, porn on the Internet. So we don't want to – if if we actually broadcast that on the camera, it would be the transmission of said porn, and then we'd be in real big trouble. As it is right now, they are, they're over 18, right? You've checked? What? <laughs> All right. But uh, we do have a great show planned tonight because we're going to be talking with a f- – couple of favorite guests here on the program stanton friedman and kathleen martin they're going to be talking with us about their new book science was wrong startling truths about cures theories and inventions they declared impossible and by they i do not mean stanton and kathleen i mean they as in the scientific establishment matt moniz you're somebody who works in science and you're somebody who's wrong from time to time Time. yeah so (laughs) i know that you don't have a problem admitting when you're wrong about things in the scientific field, but has it been your approach that science as a, as a field of study has a hard time admitting when maybe they, they were against something that they shouldn't have been? I deal with that stuff every day, <laughs> and that has nothing to do with things paranormal. No, no, it's just anything. And, and most of the stuff that we'll talk about tonight is not actually paranormal. It's uh, stuff outside the paranormal as well. To me, I don't know. Hindsight is twenty twenty, of course, but... Uh, Stan and Kathleen, through this book, they take you through step by step the innovators of certain things and exactly when everybody turned on them. And then you see that magic moment, well, okay, okay, you know, maybe they were onto something. For example, you know, vaccinations against uh, disease, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. You know, things that to us make perfect sense, but for years were resisted. And then retroactively, the people who made these discoveries and made these advances are honored. But uh, a lot of the cases in the book, they never seem to get the recognition that they deserve either. So we'll get into all that and more with Stan Friedman and Kathy Martin in just a few minutes. Uh, We do want to let everybody know there is one ticket, at least as far as I know. I haven't checked with Leanne yet, but one ticket remaining for Dead of Winter at the Lizzie Boyd and Bed and Breakfast next Saturday night, February 26th. We will not be here. We will not be doing a program that night uh, because the Bruins are on. So... If you want to have a spooky South Coast experience next Saturday night, the only way to do it is to buy that one remaining ticket. Uh, It's going to be a small investigation, 25 people. You're going to get dinner. You're going to get a tour. You're going to get uh, lectures about the history of Spiricom and the new Spiricom that's been developed by Bill Chappell. That will be presented by Jeff Belanger. Uh, And then you'll have your chance to go. We're going to do teams investigating each floor. So there's never going to be any more than six people on the floor that you're on. Well, six people plus, you know, somebody from the from the crew. But that, I mean, that's incredible to have a small group like that and be able to, to get the whole floor to yourself. And we're going to have the new Spiritcom there for you to try out. We're going to have the cell phone to the dead. We're going to have, I'm, I'm going to bring my dowsing rods. We're going to go old school. <laughs> I'm going to bring my dowsing rods. Uh, tape recorders, cameras. And uh, I know that uh, Andy was talking about bringing some of his stuff too. And Moniz, you're going to have a piece of equipment with yeah, you as I'm well. Yeah, I'm going to bring the little portable thermal. So, uh, and our plan, hopefully, is to put you in the basement with that thermal camera, and maybe you can capture that pesky little shadow person that's been bothering us every time we go there now. I hope to. Ah, sounds good to me. I hope uh, if 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 you haven't heard the stories, and of course you can read about it in my book, Ghosts of the South Coast. But go back and listen to some of the past episodes where we talk about it and. Uh, whatever it is that's down there, it's definitely interesting. It's been seen not just by us, but by other people who have uh, been at the house as well. All right, well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll bring Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Marden on to talk about their new book, Science Was Wrong, 
startling truths about cures, theories, and inventions they declared impossible. And of course, the phone lines will be open throughout the program, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. You can email us, Spooky Crew at SpookySouthCoast.com, and you can jump in the chat room on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. So we'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. This heavyweight bout is about to begin. The challenger wears white trunks with a blue stripe, and the champ is wearing, uh, looks like an examination gown from the doctor's office. And from the back, we can... Ooh, that's not pretty. Champ, what's with the crazy getup? I've got to take care of my family. Yeah, so? Well, when you love your family, you got to go in and get those important medical screenings. A lot of potentially deadly diseases can be treated if you catch them in time. So you wear the examination gown because... Because I'm a real man. Real men take care of their families and get those tests. Real men wear gowns. Okay, champ, good luck. Here we go. <laughs> the champ's not wasting any time. <laughs> oh, oh. It's over. This fight is over. Champ, you barely broke a sweat. Any words for your fans out there? Remember, go to ahrq.gov for a list of the tests they need to get and when to get them. What was that web address again? ahrq.gov. And remember, real men wear gowns. Go to ahrq.gov. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, AHRQ, and the Ad Council. AM 1420, WBSM. Available anywhere and anytime at wbsm.com. Just one click gives you local news and weather, national and world news, business and entertainment news, and of course, sports. WBSM.com has the Pete Braley and Ken Pittman blogs, chances to save with half-price hookup and iBid, and even ways to win. One click does it all from anywhere at any time. WBSM.com. Run! Save yourself! It's coming! Frankie, what's wrong with you? The April tax deadline, it's getting so close, and I haven't even started my paperwork. Oh, no. Pardon all the drama, but if you've waited until the last minute to do your taxes, there's a better alternative to pure panic. Just go to www.irs.gov, your reliable source for all things taxes. Get a grip, Frankie. We'll figure it out. But the forms, the math, it's terrifying. Ah! That's www.irs.gov, where you'll find all the information you need, like how to e-file your taxes so you don't miss that April deadline. All the forms are there, too, including the 4868, the one you need to file for an extension. See, Frankie? There is hope. We're going to make it. It's local high school basketball this Wednesday night on WBSM. This is Jack Peterson inviting you to join Mike Green and me from the Beardsworth Gonzales Gym in New Bedford High School as the New Bedford High Whalers wrap up their regular season and get ready for postseason play as they take on the Marshfield Rams. The Whalers played the Rams just a few weeks ago. So join us Wednesday night at 10 before 7 as New Bedford High hosts Marshfield on WBSM.com and AM 1420 WBSM. What if your brother or your husband, what if your son came back from the service with a spinal cord injury? When they volunteer to serve, we expect our country to be there for them if they are injured. For more than 60 years, Paralyzed Veterans of America has been fighting to ensure that we receive all of the benefits that we've earned. Thank you, Paralyzed Veterans, for helping my husband. My son. For helping my brother. You too can help. Visit pva.org, a public service of Paralyzed Veterans of America. Welcome to today's lottery drawing. And today's winning numbers are not yours, not yours, and another number that's not yours. And the final number is not yours. When it comes to having money, don't rely on luck. Brew your own coffee at home instead of buying that latte. Brown bag it to work instead of ordering it. Go to feedthepig.org for more free ideas on how to save. Feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. For America's wounded warriors, sometimes coming home can be a battle in itself. Every one of them needs our support to meet the challenges they face every day. 
The USO provides Americans a way to offer that support to our wounded warriors and their families. Join us. Visit USO.org to learn how you can make a difference in their lives. The USO. Until everyone comes home. We're just like other people. We love to sing, we love to dance, we admire beautiful women. We're human, and sometimes very human. Gaming from the studios of AM 1420 WBSF into the night and beyond. Here's more of Spooky South Coast. All right, welcome back into the show. Tim Weisberg here along with the silent assassin Matt Koth, the science advisor Matt Moniz, broadcasting live on WBSM and on Spooky TV. So you can log on to SpookySouthCoast.com and click on the Spooky TV icon and you can not only see what's going on here in the Spooky Studio, but you can jump into the chat room as well. I want to say hi to everybody in there. Sorry we didn't get the live chat going this week, uh, and I know this week I really don't have any chance of that happening, but stay tuned. We'll, we'll try and work that back into the weekly schedule, that's for sure. All right, I am so excited for this discussion because we have two of our favorite guests of all time coming back on the show. Nuclear physicist and lecturer Stanton T. Friedman received his Bachelor's of Science and Master's in Science degrees in Physics from the University of Chicago in 1955 and 1956. He was employed for 14 years as a nuclear physicist by such companies as GE, GM, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, Aerojet General Nucleonics, and McDonnell Douglas, working in such highly advanced classified, eventually canceled programs as nuclear aircraft, fission and fusion rockets, and various compact nuclear power plants for space and terrestrial applications. He became interested in UFOs in 1958 and since 1967 has lectured about them at more than 600 colleges and 100 professional groups in all 50 U.S. states, 9 Canadian provinces, and 16 other countries, in addition to various nuclear consulting efforts. He's been published uh, in more than 90 UFO, U he's published more than 90 UFO papers and has appeared on hundreds of radio and TV programs. He's the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident and co-authored Crash at Corona, the Definitive Study of the Roswell Incident, Top Secret Magic, his controversial book about the Majestic 12 Group, established in 1947 to deal with alien technology. It was first published in 1996 and went through six printings, and an expanded new edition was published in 2005. He was presented with a Lifetime UFO Achievement Award in Leeds, England in 2002 by UFO Magazine of the UK. Hello, Stan. Thank you for joining us tonight, and welcome back to the show. I'm delighted to be on. I, I need to make one change. It's now 17 other countries. I was in Saudi Arabia a couple of weeks back. Oh, wow. And how were, you, how were you received there? Extremely well. It was a panel. There were five of us. It only lasted 75 minutes. It's a long way to go for that. <laughs> <laughs> but the people who talked to the panelists over the next couple of days were all friendly and hopeful, and I got a nice letter the other day saying how much they enjoyed the panel and uh, inviting me back for next year. Well, it would be nice so, if we could get some of that Saudi Arabian money behind UFO research. Wouldn't that be neat? Well, people, <laughs> I'll tell you, people paid $4,000 to attend the fifth global competitiveness forum. How's that for a long phrase? And, oh, one of the keynote speakers was uh, Bill Clinton. <laughs> Uh, you know, they had a few uh, big shots there, a lot of big shots there. Who else could afford the money, you know? <laughs> well, did you, did you get a chance to speak with President Clinton? No, no. Because I... Uh, uh, there were crowds around him, and uh, he didn't stay for the sessions. Uh, and we didn't even know he was going to be there until the evening before, probably for security reasons. I don't know. Tony Blair was there, a panelist, and uh, so was Jean Chrétien, the former Prime Minister of Canada, and heads of all kinds of companies like Volkswagen and uh, Google and Boeing and you know it, it was a fascinating uh, trip and I must admit that uh, a lot of people said hey what are they doing with competitiveness they got oil they don't need to worry <laughs> well all you got to do is look at what happened in Egypt and it's happening in other countries in the Arab world and you'll see why they want their people to be educated they're mm -hmm. even educating women believe it or not uh, they've built the three major universities there. They are encouraging investment from outsiders. Uh, they are trying to become a modern world. Uh, you know, Egypt, too many people, not enough food, not enough jobs, not enough future. 
Uh, so they're trying to avoid that, and so far, successfully. No riots when I was there. <laughs> well, I was going to say, knowing what we know about, or what we think we know about President Clinton's interest in the UFO topic, I'm surprised he didn't seek you out. Well, you know, he did make one comment during his uh, keynote address that was interesting. He mentioned some recent scientific findings including that a planet that was much like Earth had recently been found out there and what an impact uh, that might have. So, you know, who knows what he was thinking when he said it, but it, the common comment I got was we were surprised to have the topic, uh, you know, uh, contact from outer space, but it uh, sounds intriguing. Uh, it didn't seem to bother any of the people who talked to me, and I specifically asked, one of the hosts, uh, I said, you know, the guys who spoke to me were nice, but I would expect that the people who didn't think nice things would have spoken to you, not to me. <laughs> Was there any problem? No. Very well received. Delighted. <laughs> what can I say? Well, it's funny, because if they, they ever do come down and uh, share with us some of their technologies, then uh, I'd have to say Saudi Arabia's economy might go in the tank after that. Well, that's why, the, maybe that's why they're doing what they're doing. I don't know. I mean, just like you know, it, it's easy to read into action something that may not be there. What, when the Pope had commented two years ago about uh, God made us, there's no reason he couldn't make our brethren in outer space. And my first thought was, what does he know that we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I'm not going to speculate a lot about it. I'll be publishing in my monthly column about it in uh, UFO Magazine, the MUFON Journal, and... Uh, but it was an interesting experience, although it took one heck of a long time to get from Fredericton, New Brunswick, where I am, to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. No direct flights. <laughs> I was going to say, no direct flights there. Uh, no, not even indirect. From here to Montreal, to London, to Riyadh, with long waits at airports. So, that's the price you pay. Well, I hear all those airports are lovely this time of year. Say that again? I said, I hear all those airports are lovely this time of year. You can look well, out the window and see <laughs> see what the atmosphere is like. I'll tell you, we've had a lot of snow this winter. <laughs> it was pleasant in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. No snow. <laughs> well, why don't we bring on your co-author, scientific ufologist Kathy Martin is a New Hampshire native. She's engaged in UFO research and investigation for more than 20 years and is recognized as, as an authority on UFO abductions. She received formal training as a social worker, educator, and hypnotherapist. She was awarded a BA degree with honors from the University of New Hampshire and participated in graduate studies in the education at the University of Cincinnati and UNH. During her 15 years as an educator, she innovated, designed, and implemented model educational programs. She also held a supervisory position, coordinating training and evaluating education staff. Additionally, she taught education classes on UFO and abduction history. For 10 years, she served on the MUFON Board of Directors as the Director of Field Investigator Training. In 2003, MUFON publicly recognized her outstanding contribution of advancing the scientific study of the UFO phenomenon and demonstrating positive leadership. Her articles have appeared in the MUFON Journal and Best UFO Cases. She has also written several research papers on hypnosis and false memory studies. More recently, she has been working with the UFO abduction experiencers. She is the niece of Betty and Barney Hill and the conservator of their extensive UFO collection. She is also, of course, a co-author, along with Stan, of Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience. But they're here tonight to tell us about their new book, Science Was Wrong. Good evening, Kathleen. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. It's good to be with you. You know... I was excited when I, when I saw this book pop up uh, in the, the catalogs that come out, and just seeing the title, Science Was Wrong. I know that recently the publisher had put out a book called History Was Wrong by Eric Von Daniken, but when I saw Science Was Wrong, I said, okay, I like the idea of where this is going, and then as soon as I saw that it was you guys that wrote the, wrote the book, I said, oh, that's just perfect. <laughs> how, how did this come about, Stan? How did this, the idea to kind of backtrack and show some of science's slip-ups uh, come about? Well, when we were working on uh, Captured, and I was working on Flying Saucers and Science, it became obvious that one of the big problems, the major objections to anybody getting here in the first place, was bad science by smart people. Uh, and as we look back in history, we found all kinds of examples of smart people saying stupid things, to put it bluntly. So as we met to you know, go over the, the Hill case and others, uh, we realized that, gee, 
<laughs> There's an awful lot of this uh, stupid stuff going on. Why don't we put together a book that covers a lot of the areas? And it may surprise people, but Kathy has a chapter on abductions. That's no surprise. And I have one on UFOs. But the other 12 chapters all deal with other subjects because there are so many examples. It's not just in ufology that uh, people make false claims. We, we've Remember, come... the basic rule is don't investigate, proclaim. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, we, we, I mean, we come to expect with the UFO phenomena and the abduction phenomena, we expect you know, the mainstream science to, to second-guess what people are, are putting out there for information. But there's examples here that go back to things that we take for granted now as being like, how could they ever have thought that was a bad idea? I mean, science, we're supposed to trust scientists. We're supposed to trust them to know what's best. And it doesn't seem like that was always the case. We're supposed to trust journalists, too, and that's not always the case. <laughs> well, uh, I'll admit to that. For being one myself, I'll admit to that. Uh, Kathy, when uh, when you started researching some of these other topics outside of your normal uh, fields of study, I mean, were you surprised at just how many uh, things had been poo-pooed from the beginning? Yes, I, I really was, particularly in medicine. Uh, I was really shocked when I was doing research for uh, a chapter about childbed fever uh, to find that uh, although Ignac Semmelweis, who was a medical doctor at the Vienna General Hospital back in the mid-1800s, had discovered a way to prevent childbed fever it was simply by washing one's hands, uh, the notion was rejected. And he ended up actually being fired from his job and, and disgraced over his discovery and although he had uh, the, the way that he came about discovering this is that the Vienna Hospital was divided into two maternity wards one was the midwifery ward uh, where, where they did not di dissect cadavers and then there was the medical doctors ward the new medical doctors who were training and that's where Ignac Semmelweis worked and he led his students every morning uh, into the mortuary to do their dissections. Uh, immediately thereafter, they'd just wipe their hands on their bloody aprons and take the aprons off and go into the maternity ward without washing their hands and do multiple internal examinations on laboring women. As a result, Whole rows of women and infants died within days of each other when bacteria uh, was transmitted from their hands into open wounds in the women. The mortality rate in the midwifery ward was only 2%, but in the obstetrical ward, it was 20% or higher. Now, he, when he instituted this hand-washing program, and forced all of the medical students to wash their hands before they did internal examinations, the mortality rate dropped to 2%, just the same as it was in the midwifery unit. But, you know, as I said, that idea was rejected, and it, this rejection was carried throughout Europe. Although Semmelweis uh, kept very careful records, although he did scientific experiments, uh, although he published and spoke about his discovery, doctors throughout Europe proclaimed him a charlatan. So it was uh, a very horrible story for him. He ended up going back to his home country of uh, Hungary and working there in a hospital where he instituted the idea uh, over a, a lot of criticism and resistance, but finally it worked in that hospital. And eventually, years after his death, his discovery was recognized, and there was a medical school named after him, and uh, his photograph is on the Austrian stamp. But that's just an example of how this kind of notion that something is impossible 
because it doesn't fit with our preconceived notions uh, how that is carried through. See, what's amazing to me, and maybe it's we take this for granted because we live in a world where there's running water right, right a few doors down from wherever we are, but I can't imagine spending the day putting my hands in cadavers and then just wiping my hands off on my apron. You know, I'd, I'd want to scrub as much as I could off it. Germs or not, you know, understanding that they didn't know about germs then, but being no. able to get that goo off my hand as best as possible, that'd be what I'd want to do. <laughs> I well, think that's all of us would want to do the today. The mark of a successful was doctor different. was how bloody his apron was. <laughs> that's true. Or uh, how how rare a Beatles album cover was. True, that mm. uh, goes too. But uh, well, uh, but the medical field is prime with examples of this. And, and reading in the book, there's so many different cases of where they kind of <coughs> they being the they that you write about, they kind of scoffed at any new advances, at any new ideas that didn't go with the norm. I mean, the idea of being able to, uh, first of all, even transmit smallpox, let alone be able to uh, inoculate someone against it. That was many ex one of many examples, and it, it, it's kind of scary, uh, because we'd like to think, uh, the first notion of people who read this book is, oh, well, but that was in the past, Stan. We, do, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> we do, too. <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, I wrote uh, a section on flight and on space, and it, it's in incredible how the astronomical community, for example, has been anti-space travel, anti-rocketry. The British Astronomer Royal in 1958 said space travel is utter bilge. Nobody will ever spend the money it's going to take. It would be much better to spend the money on better instruments for astronomy. That was one year before Sputnik. And what field of science has benefited the most from the space program? Astronomy. And they're still saying you can't get here from there, which is one of those stupid things. But, you know, it's not the only thing. That may be thought of as an intellectual thing. But uh, there's a chapter about uh, flight, and a guy named Billy Mitchell, one of my sort of heroes, first World War pilot, uh, American, and after the war, he was very vociferous about his conclusions that having flown during the war and watched a lot of progress in just a couple of years uh, the United States was in the war, uh, that soon we'd be, it would be revolutionized warfare would, and we'd be sinking ships from the sky by dropping bombs on them. Well, what a stupid thing to say. The Secretary of the Navy said he'd He'd stand on the deck of any ship that Billy was going to bomb and, you know, wouldn't worry about it at all. And he was court-martialed, incidentally, for uh, insubordination, because you're not supposed to disagree with the big shots. And there's a real irony here. In, on November 29th, 1941, it was the Army-Navy football game, you know, a great event every year. And in the program for the game, it was a picture of the USS Arizona, this mammoth battleship, and a comment in the write-up that nobody had ever sunk a battleship from the air. Eight days later, Pearl Harbor, and the USS Arizona was sunk with the death of 1,100 sailors. 1,100. Now, the Japanese knew that you could sink a ship, or certainly believed that you could, uh, we weren't prepared for anybody trying to do that. So uh, there are consequences, and that, that's one of the main themes of the book, is that it's not just intellectual questions, you know. It, in the real world, there are consequences. Uh, I do have a chapter on uh, so-called uh, global warming, uh, anthropogenic global warming, man-caused. And there's a an awful, it's like a delicatessen out there. There's so much baloney being served on that subject. Uh, you know, I get a kick out of, it's sad, people calling CO2 a pollutant, for goodness sakes. We have to reduce the amount of evil CO2. Hey, every living plant on this planet needs CO2. And it's not, by far, it's not the biggest uh, greenhouse gas, water vapor is, and we don't do much about that. But people are talking of spending hundreds of billions of dollars 
based on bad science, false claims, vested interests on the part of people getting their research grants, and uh, finally they're slowing down a little bit in Europe as they realize that, uh, well, we had an example here, windmills. 35 of them didn't work when it got real cold the other day. They got ice on them up here, and they stopped. <laughs> oh, they're supposed to run in the winter time too, huh? <laughs> you know, it was, it's not funny. But, uh, you know, and people are talking about solar-powered hot water heaters here up on the roof. Now, I had to pay somebody to take two feet of snow off my roof the other day. <laughs> There's global warming for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and now they're blaming the cold wave on global warming, which I find really funny. But it, what, what I'm saying is this offensive irrationality and vested interests uh, are still around. They haven't stopped. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the vested interest because uh, – that seems to be the case of, of what really is the, the, the story behind the story here. The, the chapter on the AIDS epidemic is particularly uh, enlightening to anybody that doesn't know the whole story behind that. And it kind of gives a good parable for how things actually end up progressing or actually not progressing, in, in, as the case may be. Not progressing. Yeah, Kathy did yeah, that one. Yeah, not progressing at all. Um, that was quite interesting to to research i hadn't previously realized that such a very large percentage of hemophiliacs throughout the world became hiv positive uh, directly caused by american drug companies refusing to accept the idea that their blood products might be contaminated, uh, making the proclamation that uh, there was only one chance in a million that hemophiliacs who used this, this blood product, uh, factor eight concentrate, would become HIV positive, and they were just totally wrong. And it took so much research and so many hurdles to reached the conclusion that there was a virus or there was something in the blood that was causing HIV. And there were cover-ups. For example, uh, you know, the French uh, at Louis Pasteur Institute had discovered the virus. But in the United States, the team headed by Robert Gallo didn't want to accept those findings, they had their own hat theory that they were pursuing and apparently had more power uh, with uh, magazines like Science uh, to, to be published. So the French were initially not published, even though they had these really outstanding findings, incredible findings. And it wasn't until they joined Gallo and let him put his name on the article with them that that information got out to other scientists and then of course the, the United States uh, was the first to announce that we had found the cause the virus that caused AIDS when in fact it was the French but there was an international controversy there and it held up testing uh, for a long, long time, because it ended up in court. Uh, in the end, Luc Montagnier and uh, Francois Barr, who were the French scientists who discovered this, they called it uh, GRID, uh, the ones who discovered it, uh, ended up getting the Nobel Prize in the year 2008 uh, for finding the, the cause of AIDS, not Robert Gallo and his team in the United States. And, and think of how many people suffered in the, in the interim when they were battling this out. Think of, and also with, with the hemophiliacs as well, think of how many lives were lost basically based on, uh, for one, political posturing, and on the other hand, you know, a refusal to kind of reform the way they were doing business because it would have cost money while they were trying to make money. Yeah, That's and true. An estimated 10,000 Americans became HIV positive. That's 10,000 
American hemophiliacs, 90% of the factor VIII concentrators, concentrate users became HIV positive. And simply because they didn't screen for the virus in, in any of the donations that they were getting. Well, That's yeah. right. It was actually a mistake in the beginning because they used filters um, to filter uh, viruses and, and bacteria out of the blood. But the filters really were not effective in filtering the virus out. Uh, so the blood product came through with the virus. Uh, the Germans, I believe it was, Stan, am I yes. correct, had developed the heating process uh, that would kill this virus. But it wasn't cost-effective to use in the United States, so they simply didn't implement that technique. And they went into denial. And as a result, thousands of people became infected. And what was, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stan. I was just going to say that the reason for the difficulty here was that the concentrate, the uh, factor that was being used by the hemophiliacs, was batch processing thousands of units of blood. If one was contaminated, the whole batch would be contaminated, you see. So it's not hard to understand why the, the blood system, the concentrate products, from which these companies were making lots of money, uh, would really be a bad deal. And there were some places that actually took in the old stuff and sent it off to another hospital. I mean, you know, how, how can one allow such things to happen? They did happen. That's the key. Well, Kathy, what's amazing about this, and uh, again, I'm, I'm not old enough where I can remember, you know, when I was growing up, I remember hearing about AIDS in school and, and learning, you know, in the 80s at least a little bit about it as I was growing up, but in the early stages of the public knowledge of this, it was, you know, it was only gay people had it, or only intravenous drug users had it. And it, even when there was a case of a, of a newborn infant that ended up contracting it, it still didn't convince people. What, what, what exactly was the story with that part of the case? Well, uh, they wanted to believe that it was only transmitted among high-risk populations. Uh, they, they weren't really that knowledgeable about what was causing it at that point, and there was a lot of political embarrassment in, uh, in the gay communities because of the, the bathhouses. They didn't want to close down the bathhouses, saying that, uh, you know, that it might be a tr sexually transmitted disease. Uh, but that wasn't politically correct. And the gay population was very, very generous in donating blood as well. So there, this was another political factor. And uh, they did not want to believe that other segments of the population might get this as well. That would be pretty alarming in, in a way to say, you know, watch out, your newborn infant could have HIV. You know, Stan, you mentioned before the chapters about flight and about space travel, and there's actually a parallel, I think, between what happened in those cases and what happened with the AIDS epidemic where, you know, science was short-sighted about how to handle AIDS because it was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. And you mentioned in the chapters uh, on flight and on space travel that the – you know, scientific community at the time, they couldn't wrap their head around these possibilities because they were thinking about what they already knew and what they already have, and they weren't thinking about the advancements that might come to make that possible. And that seems to be where so much of this, you know, instances where science was wrong, it's based on that short-sightedness of only what's available and not what might be to come. Yeah, my mantra has been for a very long time, because I worked on such far-out programs, incidentally, that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way, and that it's the details that determine whether a new approach to, say, flight or space or whatever works, not just use general physics and we can show that was nonsense. To, to see where you can go wrong and how far you can go wrong, Dr. Campbell, astronomer in 1941, was sick and tired of all his science fiction stuff about going to the moon. So he wrote a scientific paper, which he published. 
calculating the required initial launch weight of a rocket able to get a man to the moon and back. Just a dumb old chemical rocket. Pages of equations. Bottom line, it would have to weigh a million, million tons. Now, in 1969, we got three guys to the moon and back, still with a dumb old chemical rocket whose initial launch weight was 3,000 tons. He was off a factor of 300 million. He made every stupid assumption, and I don't like using that word, but it certainly applies here, that you could make. He assumed a single-stage rocket. It's been known for more than 20 years that you go to a multi-stage rocket. He assumed a limit of 1G acceleration. Astronauts routinely take 5Gs. He assumed that when you come back from the moon, you're going 25,000 miles an hour, you've got to slow down. But he assumed the only way you could do that was to carry a retro rocket. But, of course, it's dead weight. You've got to launch it from the Earth. You've got to slow it down at the moon. You've got to launch it from the moon back toward the Earth. And finally, you slow it down a bit back here before you, you fire it. What do we do? We say, well, gee, that weighs an awful lot. Why don't we use the atmosphere? If we're smart enough and we get the angle right, remember Apollo 13? Mm -hmm. Very important to get the angle right. You don't want to dig a hole in the ground by going too fast. You don't want to go by by going too slow. And uh, that is a major reason for reducing the weight. Another one... Uh, I call it cosmic freeloading, uh, which is what we use on all our deep space probes. When we go to the moon, why is there a launch window? What difference does it make when we launch to go to the moon? Well, why not use the gravitational field of the moon? It's there. You don't need to provide it. So there's a launch window that is a certain time when if you launch, the moon will come along. It's very reliable now and pull you in. We have the uh, Cassini spacecraft out at Saturn now. It's been there for a few years, doing great work studying the satellites of Saturn. And we sent that closer to the sun to go past Venus to get a free kick, directed back toward Earth to get another free kick, and on toward Jupiter to get another free kick. And there we are sitting out in orbit around Saturn. The weight would have... It would have been impossible for us with the boosters we had and so forth if we hadn't taken advantage of Mother Nature. Uh, and we, all our deep space probes, and it's one of the things that I get aggravated about when I hear, especially astronomers, who don't know anything about flight, that's aerospace technology, you know, aviation, stuff like that. We have the head of the Hayden Planetarium, uh, say on the Peter Jennings mockumentary of February 24th, it's almost the anniversary, uh, 2005, that our fastest craft, the Voyager spacecraft, would take 70,000 years to get to the nearest star, and scientists like to have their data before the 70,000 years. This thing doesn't have a propulsion system on it. I mean, it's like saying, well, if I throw this bottle in the ocean, that'll tell me how long it takes to cross the ocean. <laughs> That's true. Or, you know, fly a kite, and that tells me how fast I can fly around. I mean, utterly ridiculous. But what 